Good morning. On this lovely, I need to say it's spring, but it's summer now, isn't it? Summer morning. Uh, a very warm welcome to everyone, uh, with as ever a special welcome to visitors among us today. You're most welcome. Uh, we have a few this morning. And also to those of you who join us via live stream. Um, at the close of the service, tea and coffee will be served downstairs in the Undercroft. And everyone, not least our visitors, are most welcome to join us for that. Regarding intimations, um, it's with sadness I intimate the passing of Judith, Judy McDowell. Uh, Judy was an elder of the former St. Andrews and St. George's and for many years organized the children's book section of the Christian Aid sale. She is remembered with great affection. And we hold in our love and prayers Katie and James and other members of the McDowell family at this time of loss. And let me remind you of the summer jazz concert for Amnesty this Wednesday the 7th from 7 to 9 p.m. And in case you were planning to attend, unfortunately, next Sunday's vigil to pray for peace in Ukraine has had to be cancelled. Uh, with sister congregations, however, we hope to uh, share in a particular prayer for Ukraine at next Sunday's morning service. And I commend to your careful perusal all the intimations in this week's newsletter. And now our call to worship. We come together to praise God the Creator. We come together to worship God the Saviour. We come together to experience God the Spirit. So let's worship God together, singing our first hymn, number 147, All Creatures of Our God and King.
Let us bring to God our prayers. Let us pray. Eternal and holy God, three in one, we join with the saints on earth and in heaven as we bring our worship to you. You are neither made nor fashioned by anyone, wonderful beyond measure, greater than our highest thoughts. You are faithful Father, servant Son, and enlivening Spirit. We rejoice to be together in your presence, acknowledging you as our God in joyful worship and grateful praise. Loving Father, kind and merciful, full of goodness and compassion, constantly watching over us and directing our steps, we praise you. Saviour Christ, flesh of our flesh, yet the living image of God, sharing our humanity, yet one with the Father, loving even to death on a cross, yet bringer of life in its fullness. We exalt you. Holy Spirit, free and mysterious, source of guidance and inspiration, filling our hearts and minds, we welcome you. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be glory and honor this day and every day. Together we come confessing the many ways in which we have failed you and one another. Truly we have all sinned and fallen short of your glory. Grant us the grace of true repentance and your Holy Spirit, transforming us to new life. Restore us, Lord. So may we give ourselves willingly and joyfully to be of benefit and blessing to one another that we may truly share one faith, have one calling, and be of one soul and one mind, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we now pray in the words he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We share the peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. for this life and all its blessings, for love at the heart of your purpose, for light in the world brought once in Jesus Christ and shining ever through his spirit. Shine your light on us, on your church and on all people. May we always have a grateful heart and a will to love and serve you. Graciously receive the offerings we bring of money, time, and talents today and each day for the advancement of your kingdom as we offer you in love the service of our own lives through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. 
we continue to worship God as we sing our next hymn, which is 112 in the hymn book, God Who's Almighty Word. first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, from verse 1 to verse 5, and then from verse 26 to 28. And then we move to chapter 2, ending at verse 3. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was complete chaos and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. <clears throat> then God said, let us make humans in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, 
and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. On the sixth day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Here ends the first lesson. So now we move to the second lesson, which is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. <clears throat> now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but they doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Here ends the second lesson. Amen. Thank you. We continue in worship as we sing our next hymn number 542 in the hymn book. Lord, speak to me that I may speak.
And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The late, great Jonathan Sachs, uh, the former chief rabbi, in his book, Future Tense, reflecting on the future of the Jewish people, points out that while the Chinese ideogram for crisis um, also means opportunity, the Hebrew language, he says, is more hopeful still. The word crisis Mashbeer in Hebrew also means a childbirth chair. And Sachs' remark is that the Jewish reflex is to see difficult times as birth pangs. Something new is being born. That the church in Scotland and the Church of Scotland is passing through such critical times cannot, I think, be denied. And for us, this raises the fascinating question of whether these challenging times may in fact prove to be what Sachs' vivid image suggests, not the last chapter of a wonderful but now ending story, but rather the very birth pang of new creation life in our country. Professor Colin Gunton, one of the premier English-speaking theologians of the late 20th century, assessed the situation faced by the church in Britain in this way, and this is a few years ago. He believed that, quote, we are in danger of worrying ourselves into extinction because today we seem less the players in a great drama of redemption than the last remnants of a great experiment. But, says Gunton, that is to mistake our situation. He claims that what is needed now, quote, is to realize that what is causing our malaise, our feeling of impotence and failure, is precisely our opportunity. We are apparently left on the sidelines because the modern world has decided to follow other gods than the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that decision is destroying it. But that, says Gunton, is also our opportunity. We have to begin to organize our church life so that everything we do is ordered to mission. We are the details of God's plan for his world. Every one of those details needs to be in place. Gunton, he was, he was professor of theology at King's College, London. He pre this was part a sermon he preached in his own congregation. Um, sadly, I had the privilege of meeting him on a couple of occasions, he died suddenly a few years ago. But I still find these words of his as powerful, prophetic, and challenging as when I first read them. Today is Trinity Sunday, and our theme is the one of which Colin Gunton was speaking, namely, mission. To which someone might understandably respond, what on earth has mission to do with the Trinity? Well, rather a lot, as it turns out. Today is a celebration of the deepest mystery of our faith, the Holy Trinity, one God whom we worship as Christians, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Probably one of the reasons for the common lectionary choice of Gospel reading for today, the closing verses of Matthew's Gospel, is its specific reference to or suggestion of the, the Trinity as the name in or into which Jesus instructs 
new disciples to be baptized. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There is, however, a still deeper reason why this passage, containing what we've come to call the Great Commission, is a good text for Trinity Sunday. I refer to something which was overlooked by the church for long years of its existence. And that can be expressed in the succinct formulation of Tim Dearborn, quote, it is not the church of God which has a mission. It is the mission of God which has a church. Let me say that again. It is not the church of God which has a mission. It is the mission of God which has a church. In other words, when we give thought to mission, as we are being much encouraged to do rightly these days, we go off the tracks at the outset if we begin with the mission of the church. We begin rather with God, the triune God, as theologians like Chris Wright have convincingly, and I would say excitingly shown, the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation can be understood as being generated by and all about God's mission. The Bible's grand narrative gives us the, the big picture of God's mission from creation to new creation. Genesis 1 and 2, to Revelation 21 and 22. And we need to see how the different parts fit together. So the Bible shows us God on a mission, a mission to transform and redeem the world he created, spoiled by human sin and rebellion, and to bring all of that into a new creation, inhabited by redeemed humanity in a world of perfect peace, justice, and love. It is not the church of God which has a mission. It is the mission of God which has a church. Where then do we, where does the church fit into this big picture of the mission of God? All mission is one. The point for us being that all that we do in mission finds its place in forwarding the one mission of our triune God. Ours, in other words, is a co-hyphen mission. You notice the hyphen that I put in. It wasn't a misspelling. Co-mission. We are, as Paul wrote, fellow workers with God. And this is where the so-called five marks of mission come in um, that we, we, we hear so much about. They were around in the Anglican Communion. They beat us to it in the, in the mid-1980s and were adopted by our denomination and incorporated into the General Assembly's so-called Presbytery Mission Plan of 2021, further revised. Earlier understandings of mission tended to drive a wedge between the church and mission. Mission was seen as a distinct task, for the most part undertaken by those who had a you know, particular skill, particular skills in that area, or, or a missionary calling. We sent them out to the four corners of the world. And, and it was usually understood as only evangelism or church planting, nothing more. And what the five marks of mission present to us is an understanding of mission that is wonderfully holistic and comprehensive in its scope. And in this way, underlining and lining up with the global mission of God as revealed in Scripture. It's worth refreshing our memories of their content. There they are. I won't bother reading them. There they are on the screen, and they are worth looking at carefully. Or 
in still briefer form as a useful aid memoir, Tell, Teach, Tend, Transform, Treasure. Good way of remembering the five marks of mission. And when we grasp that the primary mission we're speaking about is the holistic global mission of God in Christ, it completely transforms the way we think about the church's mission. The famous missiologist David Bosch argued years ago that many biblical and theological elements of mission had been split asunder or lost in the modern era. And in a helpful way, the five marks reintegrate those elements that should never have been torn apart in the first place. But what do the five marks have to do with the Great Commission as we read that together at the end of Matthew's Gospel? Are you really saying, you might ask, that the disarmingly simple instruction of Jesus at the end of Matthew has room for all of that? Well, yes, it has. See, we tended to begin our reading of the Great Commission at verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. But that's not how it begins at all. As the lead into the five marks picks up the mission of the church as the mission of Christ, Jesus' first words to his disciples as he met them after his resurrection on that Galilean mountainside were not a command in the imperative mood. They were a great affirmation in the indicative mood. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, astonishing words. The Great Commission in Matthew and the five marks of mission find their center in the Lordship of the risen and ascended Jesus. Take the fifth mark, the one maybe that might seem on the surface least in tune with the Great Commission in Matthew to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. Now, in a past time, that would never have been seen as part of the mission at all. But whose earth is it? Who is the rightful Lord of all creation? And it's important to see what Jesus is uh, that when Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he is deliberately and remarkably using words that are applied to Yahweh, the God of the covenant God of Israel in Deuteronomy. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul penned some exquisite words about the cosmic Christ, the colossal Christ of Colossians, as someone said, the cosmic Christ in whom all things were created and in whom they all hold together and through whom all things on earth and in heaven are to be ultimately reconciled, Paul says. As Abraham Kuyper, a former Dutch prime minister, famously said, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. If Christ loves and cares for and plans fully to renew his creation, creation care becomes an indispensable element of our mission too. Creation care was part of humanity's calling at the beginning. And we who are Christ's followers are bound to care for the earth over which he exercises supreme and loving authority. Or take the first two marks of mission to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, to teach, baptize, and nurture new believers as these to be found somewhere in the great commission, most certainly. Evangelism, together with the task of teaching, baptizing, and nurturing, 
flow also from the Lordship of Christ. Evangelism, graciously, sensitively, lovingly undertaken, is vital in our mission. As we who are disciples of Jesus seek to bring others into the same life-giving relationship with him that we ourselves enjoy. And to that end, we proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Jesus, however, does not say, go and make converts, you know, with an emphasis on the initial steps of repentance and faith, important as these are. He said literally to these disciples, going, as you go, make disciples. The verb, um, one word in, in, in Greek, make disciples, is the only imperative in these verses, actually. This is where the emphasis falls. Travel with the aim of making disciples, is what he's saying. Keep that to the fore. Set everything else you do within that supreme framework. And remember, making disciples is not the task of a, a day or an hour. It's a long-haul demanding business involving an intentional pattern over time of forming Christians to be true followers in the fullest sense of Jesus. Yes, they're to be baptized into the one triune name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In our contemporary, secularized, and indeed paganized West, we can't but recall how in the early centuries, converts from paganism had to be deconstructed and then reconstructed through pre-baptismal processes in what William Willimon calls a detoxification process. It may be that Alpha and the like may well be helping serve that function in our time, the five marks following the Great Commission in recognizing that with baptism there must also be ongoing teaching and nurturing, that is how disciples are made. In his seminal book, The Invisible Church, Steve Acethorpe cites a survey which appears to show that a third of church members believe that congregational involvement has not helped their Christian growth. It's quite a shocking statistic, if it's true, and it seems to be. This suggests, says Acefort, that this aspect of the Great Commission has become a great omission. It certainly calls for more focus on what a commitment to the discipling of Christians must entail. It's essential to our mission. Remember how passionate Paul was about the need not only to sow, but to water the seed of the planted gospel. He tells the Corinthians that he who sowed the seed in the first place there, and Apollos who, when Paul had to leave, came in to water that seed, are part of the one mission of God. Paul planted the seed, Apollos then watered it, and God has been making it grow. In one particular study, the conclusion is congregations need to reevaluate the opportunities they provide for Christians to explore faith, work through questions and doubts, and grow in Christian character. And in many ways, I know you're seeking to do that. Because after all, disciples are called to become like Christ in character and humble service to God. That's the work of a lifetime. Which brings us to the remaining two of the five marks of mission, numbers three and four. 
tend and transform loving service and the pursuit of justice and reconciliation. And yes, these two are embraced within the authoritative, holistic, great commission of Jesus. For going and making disciples involves this requirement. He said, go and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. The late Professor David Wright of New College, my, my own Dr. Father, makes the interesting point in I think what was his last article um, before he passed away it was on the Great Commission interestingly enough David um, points out that Jesus in this Great Commission seemed to envisage a special place for the teaching of the New Testament Gospels in the worldwide Christian mission. And he, he, then he says, tellingly, he says, it, that might, it might appear outrageous to think otherwise. But some of us have by habit and perhaps conviction been more often Paul people than gospel people. And that rings lots of bells for me and where I come from. It was certainly true of me for a long time. A kind of unspoken assumption that the path of Christian maturity takes you from the nitty-gritty down to where practicalities of the Gospels and Jesus' ministry to the exalted cerebral and spiritual realm of Pauline theology. Well, with Marks 3 and 4 in mind, what particular teachings of Jesus are we summoned to obey and call others to similar obedience? Well, we could spend an age on this, but don't worry. Let me just offer a couple of instances from Matthew itself of Jesus' teaching without further comment. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are the merciful. Teach them to obey. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. Teach them to obey. Matthew 23, 23. Jesus to the Pharisees having given them jip for their obsession with religious minutiae. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. Teach them to obey. We could go on and on. I hope the point has been sufficiently made. United, holistic mission. That's our calling. Because that plugs us in, as it were, to the mission of God himself. The Great Commission has not been withdrawn, nor shall it ever be, until the parousia. And as with all our shortcomings and doubts, did you notice in our reading that while the disciples in meeting Jesus on that mountainside worshipped him. Some of them doubted. But Jesus did not exclude the doubters from among his worshippers. He says, you two, are you willing to come along with all your doubts? Well, come then. And as we seek to give obedience to our Lord's marching orders in our time, we have the most heart-strengthening encouragement conceivable in Jesus' final words. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. What a promise. It frames Matthew's whole gospel Jesus was named Emmanuel in chapter 1. God is with us. And the full import of that name for his continuing mission through us now becomes crystal clear 
Because as we go, we do not go alone. Our missional Lord is with us. Pass us as he may us. All of the days, for the whole of every day, is what the Greek means. Right on to the end of the age. I cannot think of a better note in which to sign off than that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we come to our next hymn, which is number 448 in the hymn book, in case you're going to accompany us on the piano. And number 448, Lord, the light of your love is shining. Dear God, you have called on us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. We pray that the belief and authority that you have given us through the words and example of your Son, Jesus Christ, will enable us to carry the gospel across the street, across the seas, and across the world. We pray that we can harness the power that you have given us to inspire other people 
so that they themselves become disciples of your church across all the nations. We understand and accept this task of yours, the Great Commission, and we pray that we will be worthy of your expectations. We undertake to think of our missionaries and our church leaders and to consider how we can support them further in their roles as messengers and communicators of God and Jesus Christ. We will pray even more strongly for our world leaders in that they show judgment, obedience to your guiding principles and leadership towards your principles. We pray that we will have the strength to listen more carefully to other opinions, to debate them, and to persuade peacefully but tenaciously that your gospel is the best way for all nations to live. God, through your Son Jesus Christ, you have taught us to listen to your gospel and to trust your authority. We hope and pray that each one of us, in our own individual ways, can give you a clear signal that we have contributed to your great commission. God, we remember that you are always with us to the end of the age. Amen. So we come to our closing hymn this morning, number 182. 182, we stand to sing. Now thank we all our God. forth and in all of life worship the Lord entrust yourself to the winds of God's spirit put to death selfish desire and offer yourself for God's mission in the world and the blessing of God Almighty 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you.